Hi everyone, this is Yanaro Barrio Sanchez. Um, we had a couple uh, technical difficulties. If you are on Facebook or YouTube, this is Memorial Healthcare System, and we are talking today about Stroke Awareness Month, and we're having a Facebook and a YouTube Live that I'm hoping is working because, um, so if you were on earlier, Thank you for sticking with us. And if not, I'm sure you can get this information. We're excited to bring you two of our professionals today. So we have uh, Dr. Chuku and Dr. Kamal. Dr. Chuku is from Primary Care. She's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, some of the things we can control um, when it comes to stroke. And Dr. Kamal with the Neuroscience Institute really is our stroke expert here, right? We're going to jump right in again, and I apologize for any technical issues. Um, and as I mentioned before, you can always leave us some comments. Um, Dr. Chuku is a primary care physician that hopefully we all see you at least once a year, right, um, for our checkups. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what we can do to help lower our risk of stroke? Absolutely. It's a very important issue that we're raising here. And, you know, what's interesting we found in these studies is that uh, the stroke incidence actually within the last two decades decreased, but recently we've seen an upswing in this. And the thought has been likely related to the increase in obesity and the prevalence of diabetes. It's, it's an epidemic. And so given that this prevalence has increased, we've seen a little bit of an increase in the number. Now, I've had patients that come in to see me, particularly even today, this morning, um, with an elevated blood pressure. And oftentimes they may ask me, hey doc, what do you think could possibly happen if I stop taking my medication? You know, sometimes they want to know the true consequence of what would happen if they are uncontrolled so that they would have a good motivating force to actually control their current condition. And I explained to him, I said, look, your condition of hypertension, it can lead to cardiovascular disease, it can lead to stroke. And when we began to have, sit down and have that conversation about stroke, I went to ahead and to describe what a stroke is, you know, primarily a stroke affects the arteries in the brain. And what happens is kind of the conduit, the arteries that act almost like a hose. If there's a blockage or if there's a rupture, the key nutrients and oxygen that normally will get supplied to the other part of the brain, they no longer have that available. And when that is no longer available, the cells can die. And so usually when people have stroke symptoms, they have a, just a limited amount of time to get help, about 4.5 hours. So it's really important that things that we can control, such as our blood pressure, making sure that you read labels, look at the sodium content. For the American Heart Association, we recommend no more than 140 milligrams of sodium per serving because that's technically considered true a low sodium diet. When you follow that, when you implement other factors such as staying active, exercising 30 minutes, three times a week to the target heart rate, also monitoring your blood sugar levels, these are all together important mechanisms that we can use in society as a whole to decrease everyone's risk of stroke. And we all can do it. We just need to work together. Um, thank you, Dr. Chuku. So you mentioned a couple things. I, um, blood sugar, diet, sodium intake, blood pressure, so important. Some people's blood pressure is not under control. Cholesterol is also one of those, right? Correct. Cholesterol is very important. You know, in 2021, one in six deaths from cardiovascular disease was due to a stroke. If you think about it, every 40 seconds, someone has a stroke in the United States. That's pretty significant. That's about the time that it takes for you to sing happy birthday twice, right? And so when we think about these things, we realize the prevalence of stroke. And we can actually be very proactive to help engage our family, our friends, educate the community as a whole to help us get better control of our cholesterol, blood pressure, and blood sugar. Nonetheless, it's very important that at least once a year you're seeing your primary care doctor because at least you can establish that baseline to have a good idea of where you stand so that you'll know how often you need a follow-up and establish that excellent health care outcome. 
Thank you, Dr. Chuku, for that. And um, with that information, I do want to go to Dr. Kamal because as our stroke expert here, right? And I want to talk a little bit about common causes of strokes, different types of strokes, and particularly those things about us that we just can't control. Thank you, Yanet, and uh, for having us here. And uh, thank you, Dr. Chuku. That was uh, very beautifully put. And, and I think uh, uh, I'd like to get, kind of just re uh, I reiterate what you mentioned. Uh, stroke is the leading cause of disability in the world. Uh, and really that is the key word that a stroke leaves not only the patient disabled, but it's a huge burden, both economic, financial, physical on even the family members. And the reason why it's extremely important to discuss uh, and spread awareness is it is very much treatable. We can treat it, we can reverse the symptoms almost completely sometimes. If uh, you know a timely um, intervention is done with the patients coming into the hospital on time. Uh, and so really the uh, a stroke, as you mentioned, is a blockage of uh, either blood flow to the brain, which is the predominantly more common subtype, 80% or 85% of strokes are like that. The other uh, less common but equally devastating type of problem is to have bleeding in the brain, which happens around 15 to 17% of the time. Uh, we'll talk more about the, the dry type of stroke today. And so what I like to explain to patients often is think of the arteries or the pipes that supply fresh blood to the brain like the branches of a tree. They keep getting smaller and smaller. And depending on what level of blockage uh, happens in the artery, uh, the patient will have some kind of a, a deficit. It could be difficulty walking, difficulty speaking, difficulty with their uh, strength on one side that we'll chat more about. But uh, you can have strokes from different, different causes uh, but really, uh, the, the risk factors, like you mentioned, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, uh, the emphasis on controlling the, that cannot be overemphasized. It, it's very important for everyone to be cognizant of what things will lead to problems in the brain. Uh, and really, these are the same factors that cause heart attacks, they cause problems in the legs because the arteries are the same all over the body. So you can have a small clot that can basically block a small artery inside the brain from long-standing high blood pressure, diabetes, or cholesterol. Or in some other cases, you can have a clot form de novo in the heart or break off from a plaque in the neck that will basically block off one of the bigger pipes leading to a more devastating kind of a, a presentation where the patient will be completely paralyzed and, and they won't be able to speak anything and so forth. Mm -hmm. And really, time is the number one factor that we are all fighting against in a stroke. And, and I think to supplement some of the numbers, uh, every second somebody has a stroke, uh, they're losing uh, almost, uh, or after every minute, they're losing 2 million brain cells per minute. Uh, and this is irreversible damage that is happening. But if you come into the hospital on time, uh, these days we can do a variety of treatments that we'll, we'll cover in a bit uh, that can really help us fight stroke uh, and reverse the symptoms sometimes to the point that the patient will walk out completely normal in a couple of days, uh, feeling very well. Thank you for that, Dr. Kamal. And I have a question, a follow-up question to what you were just saying. Um, from all, from everything you were saying, how does family history or genetics play a role in stroke? So if, if Lord forbid, your father had a stroke or grandparent, um, is there a tie and also in genetics and ethnicity as well? That's a great question. You know, I think, Janet, uh, we are seeing, uh, unfortunately, more and more young people have a stroke, which is something we, we did not expect in the past. We would think, you know what, a stroke would be something that happens to the elderly. Uh, and so when we have somebody who's uh, young, and, and young in our di dictionary or definition is anybody who's less than 55 years of age, um, that's where the question of, of genetics comes in uh, even more so. Uh, what we have understood today is um, some people just have a tendency to have a thicker blood composition than others. That's called a hypercoagulable state. And these patients typically come in with, with uh, big strokes or bad strokes very early on, sometimes even in kids. In, you know, pediatric patients have strokes, which is almost scary to think about. Um, the other uh, is genetics. And so we know from very good data that certain ethnicities, certain populations, namely the um, you know, Hispanics, Southeast Asians, Asians, uh, African Americans are more predisposed to having blockages uh, inside the arteries in the brain. And so these arteries uh, in, in these patient populations uh, and all of us just by dint of our genes are more liable to have 
plug deposition inside, which will lead to blockages. Now, in patients who are uh, Caucasian, on the other hand, they have more of a tendency to accumulate plaque in the neck here, or uh, basically will end up having uh, clots form in the heart that will travel up. So really, it's interesting, but uh, I guess our ancestry does uh, continue to chase us down, even even uh, no matter how far we are from it. Um, and then there's a third people, uh, the third subgroup who uh, we'll talk about in a bit is some people just have a higher tendency to have uh, tears develop in the arteries in their neck. Uh, and these are uh, sometimes the younger patients who we see with, with really bad tears that can cause the entire brain to have starvation of blood flow or, or lack of or blood flow to stop. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. And as we're talking about the, the different things that affect the stroke, something we always talk about, and I want to cue a little video that we have. It's really fast because we should even teach our children because many times we're alone with our children. And we want to talk about be fast. So let's go ahead and show that video. With a stroke, every second counts. To spot the signs of stroke, Memorial Healthcare System reminds you to remember be fast. B, balance. E, eyes for vision trouble. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. And T, time to call 911 immediately. With four certified stroke centers, Memorial leads with stroke. Learn more at mhs.net slash stroke. So I want to thank our marketing partners for putting the video together, but it is so true, right? And those are some signs that no matter what age we are, that if we have that facial paralysis or that slurred speech, anything like that, um, we should absolutely, our loved ones should help us by calling 911. Um, and before we bring on your patient, I wanted to ask you, I know, and in this video we saw a little bit, tell us about the importance of calling 911 and how we work with our local EMS to make sure our patients get to us as quickly as possible. Thank you, yes. Yeah, so, you know, EMS basically plays the most important role really in this stroke chain of survival. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, the kind of hospital that you end up at really dictates how your treatment will be and how well you will do. Uh, and for that matter, um, the state or the on a national level, we have designated some stroke centers of excellence. These are called comprehensive stroke centers that have all the stroke expertise uh, and all the technological and, and operating room uh, requirements, including critical care coverage to take care of patients coming in with any and all types of strokes. Now, when somebody has uh, a stroke symptom, the most important thing the family member should do is actually call the ambulance, 911. Don't try to drive the patient over. You're way better off coming in an ambulance because everyone will be prepared and ready for you here. Uh, and what Memorial does uh, as part of our stroke program and the Memorial Neuroscience Institute, we actually go out to uh, all the fire stations that we work with. Uh, we, we do frequent lectures and education series with them and we teach them about the stroke signs and symptoms so that when they go pick up a patient at home and if they find that a patient has um, significant stroke deficits, uh, they will in fact um, notify us uh, right from the field that, hey, we have picked up a stroke patient who looks uh, significantly impaired. Uh, and that very often for me and my team is a sign to be prepared uh, to actually go in with the procedure through the leg or through the hand get up into the brain and, and open up the blockage manually, which is called a stroke thrombectomy. Uh, and so really the whole idea of this stroke chain of survival is no time is wasted. As soon as the patient is picked up by the EMTs and we are notified, our mm -hmm. ER is ready, our operating room is ready. And, and if needed, then we can do this procedure, which is a stroke thrombectomy, which uh, opens up the blockage and people have uh, fairly good recoveries. Um, okay. I think I just want to point out this procedure is really one of the strongest or probably the strongest procedure in all of medicine from the kind of benefit that it can provide to the patient provided they come into the right hospital uh, and in our system memorial west and memorial regional are the two comprehensive centers of excellence uh, where we, we provide this kind of treatment thank you for that and dr chuku from the primary care um standpoint right when you're working with with patients that perhaps um have had a stroke and I think we've talked about and we'll talk about it a little bit more that if you've had a stroke, you are definitely at higher odds of, of having a second stroke. So from the primary care angle, um, what would you like to share with our community? 
Yeah, so it's really interesting. Oftentimes I see patients after they have had that hospitalization admission and they've been admitted for a stroke and they're coming to me with various concerns. They often come in with their family member, whether it's a spouse or a son or daughter. And their goal is to get back as much as they can to be more independent. Because remember, uh, in stroke, a lot of people can experience depression or anxiety. This is something very real. So it's important that if a patient is experiencing this, that you actually identify it while they are admitted. And studies show that once this is treated, it actually can decrease their hospitalization stay. So when they come in to see me, they're looking for that hand um, to hold. They're looking for someone in behavioral health that can help them because in some cases, personalities can change depending on which part of the brain the stroke has affected. You know, people may have a decreased ability to take care of themselves. So rehabilitation is key. It's the utmost importance, especially when you can get that done intensively within that first year. So Memorial has an excellent rehab facility. And with that, uh, within the Memorial Rehab Facility, it is a tailored approach to help each and every patient get back to where they once were as much as possible. It is rigorous, but there is a detailed plan to help each and every patient every step of the way. So please, patients, when you have experienced a stroke, please contact the Memorial Rehab Institute. It is an excellent way for you to get back to where you need to be and to improve your outcome. Thank you. Thank you. And we did put the phone number and we'll bring it back for those of you that want the number to the rehab institute, to Memorial Rehab Institute. We have five different centers throughout South Broward County. So there is the phone number. With that, I want to bring in a very special person. Uh, Luisa um, had um, has survived a, a stroke and she's here to tell us a little bit about her story and remind us that not all strokes are the same and that we, f we might feel something, everybody feels something a little bit different, but we want to be cognizant of what we're feeling. So I want to bring in Luisa. Luisa, welcome and thank you for joining us. Hello, how are you? Good, good. So everything started uh, this past December. I thought I had a normal cold, headaches, coughing. After more than one week, the headache continued, coughing continued. So I decided to go to the hospital. They had told me that I that I had um, um, a respiratory infection. So they they sent me home with medication. After two days passed, I drove to the store, which my daughter noticed that I was driving more to one side. Then then after that. Um, that later, later that afternoon, she also noticed that part of my face was dripping, dripping. Yes. And I had blurry vision later at night when I woke up to go and use the restroom. I fell because half of my body was numb. My husband immediately took me to the hospital. They had told us that I was having a stroke. And also they told us that I had stroke before on which I didn't have any symptoms. Then after that, uh, Dr. Kamal helped, uh, helped us to answer all the questions. We didn't know what was, you know, the symptoms of any strokes. I don't have any family. I, I, I haven't had any family that have passed through all that. And then he, Dr. Kamal had a procedure doing on me. He put two stand, my artery, mm -hmm. avoid further strokes. Mm -hmm. And so Luisa, you tell us that, so for about a week, right, you had a horrible headache along with this cough. So it yes. was, Many people describe as the worst headache they've ever had or, and it just wasn't going away. And then things got worse for you as the blurred vision and the one side. Correct. We're really glad that your husband said, that's it, we're, I'm taking you in. 
because uh, you were being a little hard headed, right? Most of us are. Most of us are. We've had, I had a patient the other day, one of Dr. Kamal's patients, and she said, I'm so glad that I couldn't speak because if I could speak, I would say, get me a glass of water. I'll be fine. You know, I just got a little bit dizzy. And to be fair, she said, I'm glad that I couldn't because I went to the right place. So, um, and with that, you described how Dr. Kamal worked on two arteries. And I wanted to um, ask Dr. Kamal a little bit more about Lisa's condition and um, why the two arteries, um, what happened there? For really coming out and, and sharing your story, I think um, this will go a long way in helping people, um, uh, you know, probably hear from you and, and kind of learn from what can happen. I, I think uh, something that Yana just touched upon, right, that sometimes we are in denial. We, we hope that whatever symptoms we are having, happening or feeling will go away or, or we think, you know what, it cannot happen to me. And I think, uh, unfortunately, what you had to go through, that is uh, an example that, you know, you, you are a healthy young lady, really uh, no major risk factors. And yet um, the, you know, the events preceding um, the admission had led to uh, basically tears in arteries, uh, in the two main carotid arteries in her brain. Um, and really, so her brain was getting completely starved of uh, blood flow from both sides. Uh, the, the left and the right both were almost uh, 98 to 99% blocked uh, when we initially did some advanced imaging when she came into the hospital. Um, you know, I think as, as I touched upon earlier, some people just have a higher tendency of having uh, fragile arteries that can tear. Um, uh, in Luisa's case, once we took more history, we realized that she had undergone a procedure where her head had been tilted backwards. In this case, it was a dental procedure, but it could be sometimes after a chiropractor manipulation. Uh, so I always advise uh, any patient who I can get a hold of and family and friends, don't let a chiropractor touch your neck. Uh, there is an American Heart Association advisory that uh, rapid manipulations or jerking will tear the arteries and it will cause a stroke. Um, so, you know, when she came in, um, I always tell her Osman saved her life. You know, he, he insisted on bringing her in. And uh, we did some advanced imaging and we found that uh, really there was limited blood flow. So initially she was admitted to our neurosciences ICU and we treated her with some uh, blood thinners because the goal is typically to avoid surgery if we can. And obviously there came a point uh, in the course of the next few days where I realized that uh, we would have to go in and place stents at least on one side. Um, and so I think we have a few pictures also. Yeah. Right. Um, wow. Absolutely. We'll see if we can get those up. Yep. There you go. Thank you. So, yeah. So the first picture here on the left is, as you can see, this is an artery. This is the carotid artery. And it should really be as good as this picture here, number four. This is how robust and, and big it should be. But it was completely torn, as you can see, with a lot of damage all the way. The other artery, this is the other side, the second picture. So the first picture is the left side. The second picture is the right artery, the right one that goes to the brain. And even that was significantly damaged. There was absolutely no blood flow going to the brain, which was actually causing strokes to happen. Uh, they'd already had some strokes, uh, but had we done nothing, this really would have been uh, almost a fatal stroke. So we tried with some blood thinners that didn't really uh, take care of it. And so I went in with a catheter through the groin and we basically deployed two stents and reconstructed the entire artery to make it look uh, nice and robust as before. Uh, and obviously we continued the medical management after that. And uh, Luisa thankfully made a fantastic recovery uh, with, with really no deficits from the stroke uh, as Dr. Chuku was talking about. Um, I know she needed some therapy, but really this is this is the beauty of uh, complete holistic care ending with therapy where, where you can really help patients make a full recovery, uh, especially in young people. And thank you so much, Dr. Kamal. And Luisa, how are you feeling? This just happened in December and you're here talking to us. And I know that um, you prefer Spanish over English, and but your English is doing great as well as the Spanish. How are, you, how are you feeling? I'm feeling much better. I'm not feeling great every day. It's a, it's a new day, but I, I went to physical therapy and, and occupational therapy and speech therapy. Uh, I had to learn how to rewrite, how to walk, even feeding myself. But I'm doing great every day. Some days are better than others, but it's doing. I'm doing super, super great. And I and I thank you for my family, and my family have supported me and all my friends. 
motivating me every day to continue with my normal life. And that's that's amazing. Thank you so much, Lisa. And Lisa, what would you tell our community members who are watching? What would you tell other people that might be feeling how you felt? Everyone knows the body. You should know your body. When you're not feeling well, and if you have any symptoms, symptoms that you you don't recognize them, please immediately uh, go to the doctor or go to the hospital to, so you can check yourself. Because like I said, I didn't I didn't know any of those symptoms. I haven't I wasn't aware of any of those symptoms. If I wouldn't know, I would act immediately, or my family would act immediately to go to the hospital. But I will. You know, I'll, I'll be, I would like to say to everyone who's watching me to just be aware of your body. Be, just pay attention to your, of your body because that can save your life. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and I have a question for both doctors, whoever wants to answer. And Luisa talked about several different rehabilitations. And I know Dr. Chuku had mentioned our Rehabilitation Institute. Do both of you work with, uh, I'm talking to the doctors, do both of you, because you guys are over here on my screen, do both of you work with the Rehab Institute? And uh, is it normal that a stroke patient has to have all of these? You know, how is, is there a norm or no, everyone is different really? Oh, give us one second, Dr. Chuku. I think you're on mute. All right, go ahead. Okay, wonderful. Well, I will say this, you know, depending on the extent of the stroke, where the stroke happened, everyone's recovery may be a little bit different. But what is key is, and what's great and the beauty about Memorial is it's a team approach. So after that patient has been hospitalized, we make sure we reach out to that patient. We contact that patient. So that patient could come in to see me and I'm going to do my best urgently to make sure that I connect that patient to the appropriate resources, whether it's psychologically, whether it's regarding the rehab, whether it's social services, everything is what I'm here to help connect them with. And so the primary thing is to make sure that they are getting that rehabilitation started and initiated as soon as possible because time is of the essence. Typically, you see within that year period, that is a key time period that you use for a uh, benchmark for improvement. So making sure that the person tends to those appointments. I have a staff, a team member of uh, health coaches that continuously call the patient. We have monthly case staffing meetings where if we find that this patient may be having a little bit difficulty attending those sessions, we arrange for transportation. So the beauty of Memorial is how we take the whole team approach to make sure the patients get what they need. Because we know when someone suffers something, you know, something so tragic, it could be as a stroke and it affects the whole family, as a matter of fact, you want to make sure that as soon as possible, those resources are given to the patient and that patient gets that help as soon as possible. Because in many cases, I've had patients who are fully recovered. This can be done. Thank you, Dr. Chuku. And we have a question from, from Facebook, Dr. Kamal. Can dizziness be the only sign of a stroke? Yes, definitely. So uh, dizziness, pure dizziness, um, can certainly be a sign of a stroke in the back of the head. And that's something that uh, we definitely ask patients to come into the ER even if I get a phone call from a patient who I know from clinic, um, if they're having severe dizziness, that sudden onset, they should definitely come and get it checked out because it can very well lead to uh, a stroke, a pretty big stroke in the back of the head. Okay. So did I miss anything? Did I forget to ask something? As we're wrapping up, um, I checked. I don't think we have a, because someone asked a question, but you answered her even before I, I got to ask you. Um, I think I um, just ahead. wanted to add um, the recurrence part, which is really tying in with uh, what happens after a stroke recovery. Uh, and really, I think it's important to just remember that patients who have had a stroke are at a slightly higher risk of having another one. And really, out of uh, 750,000 strokes every year in the U.S., uh, 150,000 are repeat strokes. And so unfortunately, it's patients who have had a stroke who have a second one. Uh, and so that's where really the importance of all of the risk factor modification that we talk about 
is there that, uh, you know, while we see patients on follow-up in our stroke clinics and we, you know, ask you to tie in with your primary and Dr. Trufu's clinics also, uh, but really when these patients go home for, for them and the family members, the most important task is to make sure they take their medications and prevent another stroke from happening. Um, and, and I think uh, that's just something also key to kind of uh, tie in that be in touch with your PCPs even after you're done seeing me in the clinic that that really the, the majority of the bulk of the work happens afterwards uh, from the patient side uh, i also do want to thank louisa for being a, a fantastic patient you know i know her family went through a lot but they were very patient through all of this it was a long journey but i'm glad uh, and it makes me very happy to see how, how well she has done I, I just gave her the green light from my end to go back to work last week when i saw her in clinic so that's amazing louisa congratulations thank you thank you dr Kamal. Thank you for everything. And I would like to thank all your staff, for your team. You, you did a great job. Thank you very much. Me and my family are grateful. Thank you. Thank you. As we thank sign you. off, as we sign off, if, and if no one else, everybody's good. All I right. would just like to thank Luisa as well, because I believe that your story, you sharing this, has absolutely brought tremendous impact, education, to other people who may indeed be in your shoes one day. So thank you for that. You're thank you. Thank um, you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Chuku. Thank you, Dr. Kamal. Thank you, Luisa. As we sign off, we say two things. Remember, be fast, right? So watch out for your family members, for your loved ones, and for yourself, right? And also teach your kids about it. Teach your kids that if, if you have any of these symptoms, it's okay for them to call 911. Um, and our, absolutely our partners at EMS will bring you in and you will get the, the best care we can possibly offer. So uh, this is Yannette with the communications team here at Memorial. And on behalf of our doctors and our team, I want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you both. All right. Bye-bye.